Hello and welcome to the virtual Hammer Museum coming to you live from Los Angeles. I'm Claudia Bester, I'm the director of the Hammer's public programs and I'm pleased to welcome you to today's Hammer Forum on the Georgia runoff for two Senate seats in January, 2021. The Hammer Forum is a series of public discussions about current social and political issues and it's made possible with support from the Rosenblum family. Now I just have a few quick notes for the audience. Please note that this program is being recorded and will be available later on the Hammer website. This program is conducted via Zoom webinar, so we can see your names and anything you type into the chat or the Q&A boxes. We'd love for you all to introduce yourselves in the chat box and feel free to talk with each other there. And the Q&A box is where you type in questions you have for the panelists. So now on to our program. Tonight we're discussing the upcoming Georgia runoff election. These high profile runoffs are being watched around the world because their outcome will have an enormous impact on how the United States is governed over the next four years under the Biden administration. They also provide a graphic case study of how elections are fought and won, the impact of the Secretary of State on whether elections are conducted in a fair and accurate manner, and whether person-to-person -person contact, digital contact, social media, or advertising in the mainstream media have more impact on getting out the vote. So another title for tonight's program could be, This is what democracy looks like now. This is gonna be the last Hammer Forum of 2020, and I think we're all relieved to see this tumultuous year end, but I hope to see you all back in 2021. And tonight we have three panelists who are all working in various capacities on the Georgia runoffs, joining the Hammer Forum to give us the latest updates and analysis. Ense Ufat is the Chief Executive Officer of the nonpartisan New Georgia Project, where the goal is to make it easier for every voter to engage in every election. Ensei and her team are also developing Georgia's homegrown talent by training and organizing local activists across the state. She's dedicated her life and career to working on civil, human, and workers' rights issues. Under Ensei's leadership, the New Georgia Project, or NGP, has registered nearly 425,000 Georgians to vote. Ensei was a driving force in merging civil rights with civic technology, allowing her team of organizers to use sophisticated targeting based on data through NGP's mobile apps. Prior to joining the New Georgia Project, NSA served as the senior lobbyist and government relations officer for the American Association of University Professors, where she coordinated initiatives for mobilizing members around legislation and regulations that impacted higher education and labor law. Ensei was born in Nigeria and raised in Southwest Atlanta and is a proud naturalized United States citizen, yay immigrant brilliance. She earned a Bachelor of Science from the Georgia Institute of Technology and a law degree from the University of Dayton. Mike Madrid is the co-founder of the Lincoln Project. He has served as the press secretary for the California Assembly Republican leader and as the political director for the California Republican Party. In these roles, Madrid played a key role in pioneering Latino outreach and communication strategies. In 2011, he helped develop the Leadership California Institute, an organization dedicated to educating and training future legislators before they get in office. Mike is currently a partner at the public relations firm Grassroots Lab. In 2001, he was named as one of America's most influential Hispanics by Hispanic Business Magazine. He's a regular commentator on Latino political issues in statewide and national media publications. Journalist Greg Bluestein is a political reporter who covers the governor's office and state politics for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. Prior to the AJC, he spent seven years with the Atlanta Bureau of the Associated Press, where he covered a range of beats that included political and legal affairs. He also contributes to the AJC's Political Insider blog. Greg is a graduate of the University of Georgia with degrees in journalism and political science. Our moderator tonight is Loyola Law School professor Jessica Levinson. Levinson studies the law of the political process, including election law and governance issues. Her work for, focuses on ethical political corruption, sorry, ethics, political corruption, voting rights, campaign finance, ballot initiatives, redistricting, term limits, and state budgets. She regularly appears as a legal and political expert on television and radio and in print. She's the host of the new podcast, Passing Judgment, and has a weekly legal segment on NPR member station KCRW here in Los Angeles. She's also an op-ed contributor for NBC.com and the associate director of Loyola's Journalist Law School. Professor Levinson served as the president of the Los Angeles Ethics Commission until 2018. She's also the founding director of Loyola Law School's Public Service Institute, which is dedicated to creating the next generation of leaders in government service. So hello and welcome, Ensei Ufot. 
Mike Madrid, Greg Bluestein, and Jessica Levinson. Hi, everybody. Welcome. I can't believe that this is the last one of uh, 2020. And it's really nice to see so many familiar hammer form names, at least. Uh, I feel like we have all been together through a lot. Our first pandemic uh, hammer form was, I think, April 22nd. And it's meant a lot to me that we could do these together. So I am going to, there we go. Now I can see all the panelists. Um, Hi, everybody. You'll, don't worry, I'm not going to monologue for the whole time. <laughs> so um, I like to start these forums by asking everybody a question that is um, unfairly broad, and I'm going to ask you to answer it very quickly. And um, Mike, I'll start with you because you know I will um, police you on the time. Thank you for doing this. This is your second appearance at a hammer forum in, I think, about six weeks. Um, so you clearly did something wrong the first time around. Um, suddenly, Georgia is all powerful. Suddenly, the eyes of the world are on Georgia. Can you remind us all why we're here? Why are we all looking at Georgia? What's happening and what hangs in the balance? Sure. Again, very briefly. Thanks again for having me, uh, Jessica and Hammer. Uh, these, these programs are fantastic. Look, Georgia holds a special place because uh, it has a unique structure in terms of runoff elections. Many would suggest, perhaps rightfully, that like some Southern states that have held runoffs uh, after general elections, they were designed to keep certain people from holding office. I think that's very uh, apt. I think it's very accurate. And I think we may actually upseat that notion this time for the first time perhaps ever. Uh, Georgia, again, has this peculiar method of having a runoff if no candidate secures over 50% of the vote in the general election. Uh, so on the November 3rd election earlier, all four of the top uh, vote counting uh, candidates fell short of that 50% threshold, forcing all four of them into a runoff for the two Senate seats. These, will, these two Senate seats will determine the balance of power between Republicans and Democrats in what is currently the slimmest margin separating Republicans and Democrats in both houses in the last 50 years. Of course, I don't need to tell anybody how politicized the environment is and the stakes that are there uh, in terms of the Biden administration, in terms of its success and ability to move a legislative agenda when everybody is so dug in. So for the moment, all of the eyes uh, of the nation will be on Georgia in a January 5th special election. Uh, we will see if the turnout numbers are as low as we're anticipated to be. But at current, with votes coming in, it looks like it will be a high turnout once again, similar to what we saw um, in the November 3rd general, excuse me, general election. Um, thank you. Uh, Ense, another question, first question to you, and we'll go deeper into all of these questions throughout the evening. But um, first, can you remind us of the names of the people who are running. And then um, it's a compound question. It's an unfair question. Can you tell us a little bit more? We heard about it in the introduction, what your organization is doing specifically in this election cycle. Yes. I definitely thought I was going to get away with an easy question. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so uh, Rep Reverend Raphael Warnock is uh, running against uh, the kind of, sort of, maybe incumbent. Uh, her name is uh, Senator Kelly Leffler. And uh, John Ossoff is challenging uh, the incumbent Senator David Perdue uh, for United States Senate uh, to represent, both of them uh, would go to represent Georgia uh, in the US Senate. And uh, I run um, two, or actually three organizations that are related, but uh, the New Georgia Project and its um, advocacy arm, the New Georgia Project Action Fund. Um, and uh, while uh, New Georgia Project, our founder was leader Stacey Abrams. Um, and when we started, the idea was to register Black folks, particularly in rural parts of the state, uh, register them for the Affordable Care Act. It quickly became clear that uh, because of the failure to expand Medicaid in Georgia, that we didn't have enough power, that Republicans in the state uh, were opposed 
to Medicaid expansion and that if we were going to get anything done, um, that we needed to change the balance of power in the Georgia State Legislature. Um, how do you do that? You start looking and realizing that at the time there were over a million Georgians of color, particularly black folks who were eligible to vote and unregistered. Uh, and then you survey the landscape and realize that like no one's actually focusing and doing that work. So we got to work. Uh, and so I love, thank you for the lovely intro. Um, but our number is actually quite, it's a lot closer to 500,000 now that we've registered nearly half a million young people and people of color in all 159 of Georgia's counties. So that's probably what we're best known for. Um, but at the core of the work that we do, we work to build power. Um, we work to leverage data and technology um, to one, expose voter suppression uh, in all the ugly ways in, in which it makes our democracy weaker. Um, and two, to win for Georgia families and like actual win, uh, not like moral victories, although those are important, um, but actual wins for Georgia families and then wins that we can defend uh, beyond one election. So we have millions of conversations uh, a year on the doors. We knock on millions of doors. We make millions of phone calls. We send millions of text messages. We build apps, we build video games, all designed to build what we call super voters. And these are people who vote in every election in which they're eligible. Um, so much for each one of these answers from Mike and, uh, and say, so we could do an hour on any one of those answers, but I really want to get to Greg. I'm so happy that you're here and that we can get your on the ground experience in reporting. And I've seen you on national television recently, even when you left your takeout bag in the chair. Um, <laughs> and, uh, I said that just to try and get your um, wife to be angry at you again about that. So what is it like to have Georgia under the microscope this year, not just for the election, but I'm hoping that it's not a fair question, but if you could kind of briefly tell us, I mean, Georgia has been in the news for the presidential primary, for the presidential general election still as of six hours ago. I mean, you were tweeting vigorously last night and this morning about presidential election issues. And now with the state runoff, um, can you just give us a sense of what it's been like in Georgia and what it's been like to really be kind of the epicenter of the political universe right now? Yeah, great. Well, and, th and thank you for having me. And today I'm actually in my daughter's playroom because I don't want to risk going down to the, the foyer with my kids tantruming. So if you can see all these weird pictures, it's because I'm in, I'm in my nine-year-old's playroom. Um, but that's a great question. And first, how we got here, I want to throw, throw out there first. It's because of, of people like NSA, Stacey Abrams, um, other Democrats in Georgia um, who, who embraced um, a different approach than had been used here in Georgia for, for years, decades of running candidates as sort of Republican lights, as, as a you know, more moderate approach and embracing more progressive ideals. And um, a lot of people thought that it wouldn't work in Georgia in 2018. Um, a lot of people, including a lot of Democrats. And it didn't, you know, it didn't work in the sense that Stacey Abrams didn't win the election, but it certainly woke up, um, I think everyone in Georgia, including Republicans to the fact that if Democrats can energize uh, their base rather than trying to appeal to to, to moderate undecideds. They can still want to win a lot of those moderate undecideds, but they also wake up um, a big chunk of their base. And that's why we're here today. That's why Georgia is in the spotlight right now because the Democrats took that gamble, went after that different approach. And here we are with, with Georgia going blue for the first time since 92 in a presidential election and two Senate runoffs that will decide the fate and control of the US Senate. And by extension, Joe Biden's at least his first two years in office and it's weird being in the middle of it in Georgia because we're used to, in 16, for example, I traveled the nation covering the presidential race, um, but you know, we, Georgia wasn't remotely on the radar. Neither Hillary Clinton nor President Trump came to Georgia after March. It just wasn't in the spotlight whatsoever. Johnny Isaacson, the incumbent senator, had a very sleepy election against, against a, a Democrat who had no chance. Um, and then 2017 was the big change for me because suddenly John Ossoff was running for um, Congress in the congressional district that I live in, in northern Atlanta suburbs, and the entire media world was watching that election as a litmus test for President Trump. And suddenly, instead of having to fly to Ohio or Nevada or wherever, I could walk to campaign events. And, and although John Ossoff also lost that race, another, and there was another close call and another reminder that, that Georgia was going to be, um, it was a changing demographics, changing state. 
and send me a battleground. And of course, that has all come to fruition this year. Um, and even Republicans, by the way, as much as they, they kind of poo-pooed the idea in 18 and 16, they realized too, 2020 was gonna be a very, very tough year for them. Um, and their strategy, probably there'll be a lot of reassessing after these runoffs, because just like Democrats had to reassess their strategy, the Republican strategy of trying to wring out every vote they can in rural Georgia while losing the, the faster growing Atlanta suburbs ain't gonna work the rest of the decade. They've got to reassess. Uh, Mike, you are one of the nation's foremost campaign strategists. Greg just talked about campaign strategy. Can I ask you to talk to us a little bit about, um, and we're out of our lightning round now, so feel free to give some slightly longer answers. Can you talk to us a little bit about what the respective strategies of these four campaigns are? And another compound question, do Democrats have one strategy that they are trying to employ and Republicans have another, or are these just really four different strategies that have nothing to do with partisan affiliation? Well, look, ultimately every campaign is, you know, in charge of its own destiny, at least tries to be. There's obviously going to be a lot of coordination because the fundamentals of the race will require uh, the Democrats to, you know, be as coordinated as they possibly can if they're going to put these seats into contention. But ultimately you are going to see disparity between the messages and the messaging, and they will capitalize on both the strengths and the weaknesses of their opposition campaigns. Let me back up just a little bit and mention a little bit what Greg was talking about, because he's exactly right. And Georgia portends not just a shift towards a more centrist position away from a ruby red state, but really towards uh, what will ultimately be a very blue state for three key reasons. And these three key reasons will be determinative in who wins these races on January the 5th. The first, as he alluded to, was the rural white vote, kind of this non-college educated, largely uh, sparsely uh, dense uh, areas of the state that dramatically overperformed for Trump when he is on the ballot. Uh, not quite so much in the 2018 midterms when he was not on the ballot, but this area is one to watch in terms of the turnout and whether or not with Trump not on the ballot and some of the divisions that are emanating in the Republican base, will these numbers show up in the same numbers that they did in 2020 and in 2016? That's the first demographic. The second, of course, is the growing uh, um, a people of color vote, uh, African-American black vote, obviously is very critical in, uh, in a state like Georgia, but you also have a growing Latino vote, which you can't dismiss. You need to put that in there as well. Uh, but overwhelmingly, if you see the same numbers of African-American voters showing up as you saw on November the 3rd, I think that puts both of the Democrats in a pretty strong place and a strong contention. The third, of course, the most critical, I would argue, because it's the largest variable, as Greg pointed out, it's that suburban periphery uh, surrounding Atlanta specifically, but some of the larger metropolitan bases as well. So no surprise, this is the way we run national campaigns, rural versus urban versus suburban votes. Uh, there's obviously disparity and leakage in all three of those, but the way these three dynamics peel off is going to again be determinative in how this wins. Incidentally, this is not uh, anomalous. Georgia is, is really, I think, very, illustrative of what we call the new Southern strategy, the Lincoln Project, the Sun Belt realigning. You saw the same dynamics at play in states like Arizona, which went blue and has been trending blue for the last four election cycles. Georgia has been pushing into contention. This was not a one-off. This trend has been evident. States like Texas are demonstrating the exact same proclivity, a four or five cycle movements towards a centrist position away from the Republican Party States also like North Carolina showing the same trend line. There are some obvious uh, exceptions in the deep South, which you know Georgia used to be amongst those numbers and in Florida for different demographic reasons. But what you're seeing is truly a political realignment that is going to see the Sun Belt states become probably the new base of support for a democratic party that is built on a multiracial, multicultural, more progressive agenda. And it will be on full display, I think on January the 5th. So turnout with all three of those key demographics is going to determine who's going to win with the high turnout numbers that have been showing up at this point uh, in time. I think it's fair to say and fair to suggest that the Democrats are probably in a stronger position than most people are giving them credit for in what would, what would traditionally be viewed as a lower turnout election. Uh, hundreds of millions of dollars are gonna be spent, literally hundreds of millions. 
And I think both turnout machines and apparatuses will be in full effect. And we'll see what kind of movement there is in those suburbs to, again, in my estimation, be determinative on who's going to be the winner uh, of a contest in January. And uh, and say I I have a question for you, but I see you looking like you want to respond. So please first uh, respond, and then no, that's good, right? In a virtual world, if I can tell that you want to respond, that makes my life much easier. Um, we could have just held up cards, but um, so please. Uh, well, go I was ahead. just going to say that I came here this evening fully prepared to disagree with you, Mr. Madrid. And I like completely agree with everything you just said. Uh, the only thing I would do is add some color and some context to say that uh, one, um, oftentimes when people think about rural voters in their mind, it's code for white conservative. And we should challenge that assumption when it comes to Georgia and Georgia voters because of the black belt, right? Uh, and these black belt counties um, that run, imagine a prom sash going across the state of Georgia. Um, and these are majority black counties, majority people of color, black and brown folks make up the majority. Um, and most of them are rural. I mean, you have counties like DeKalb mm -hmm. that are majority people of color um, that's, you know, next to Metro Atlanta, but uh, that, you know, there are battleground counties in this new battleground state uh, that are rural and majority African American. Um, and then the other thing is the North Atlanta suburbs. Um, well, actually most of Atlanta suburbs are also browning um, in a really significant way. Um, and so I want to just flag that um, the geographic story like within Georgia is getting much, much messier and much, much more complicated um, as Georgia heads to become the first state in the deep south. Now, whether or not Texas is southwest or deep south, like Happy to have that argument with people too. Uh, we can do it through barbecue or not. Um, but uh, Georgia will be the first state in the deep South uh, where white people will be the minority. And we're talking 2025, uh, so in five years. Um, and so uh, it is very much, you know, we are here because of the changing demographics that are happening in the country. Uh, but nowhere are those demographics changing more, nowhere is that change more acute and more aggressive uh, than in Georgia, and, and then I would argue uh, Arizona as well. Um, Mike has this incredibly annoying habit of walking into a room and you think you're going to disagree with him, and then he just um, <laughs> makes all the sense in the world all of a sudden, and right. you're you're stuck nodding in agreement. But um, it, and say so this was the question I was going to ask you next, which is, um, can you give us a little bit of background on? Uh, and this leads into um, a piece that Greg wrote, or um, uh, I think posted about this morning, but can you give us a little bit of background on have voter registration laws changed in Georgia in the last two, four, six years? And, um, and how does one register to vote in Georgia in comparison to other states? Is it easier? Is it harder? Are there more requirements? In I mean, I'm in California, Mike's in California pretty easy to register, comparatively pretty easy here. Right. Um, so let me, flat, Georgia voter registration laws change in Georgia every year, <laughs> every year, uh, because of this activist uh, Republican legislature that we have, um, who are working really hard to fight the future and fight the future by uh, changing laws, gerrymandering, like re redrawing the state uh, legislative lines every year. Um, I will say this, if you have a car, um, or a Georgia driver's license. Um, laws have changed recently under um, uh, the previous governor deal um, that <clears throat> get to check a box when you go to get a Georgia driver's license and say, I wanna register to vote. Um, but that is not a, an option that's available to a lot of people who are not uh, drivers. Um, and one of the things that we have been concerned about, so the way that we register voters, that people of color and young people, the majority of them, um, are registered more often than not um, via third party voter registration drives like the ones that the New Georgia Project runs every day of the year. Um, we do this work, unfortunately, under like great threat of constant investigation. Um, I mean, I, I, I think that I can be so bold and aggressive about the work that we do and in the 
communities that we do them um, because we are constantly being watched uh, by a whole alphabet soup of agencies. Uh, so we're talking about uh, the GBI, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, the SO, the Secretary of State, um, et cetera, et cetera, the IRS, right? Because of our C3 tax status. So be, being very mindful of how I talk about the work that we do and the change in demographics in Georgia and why voting matters. Um, so um, I say, and I should also flag that they are very fond of investigating us and investigating our organization and accusing us of voter registration fraud which carries with it a penalty of up to 10 years in prison and $100,000 in fines in Georgia for each form. And so we've done this work under the threat of these investigations and these criminal charges since we launched in 2014. Um, and so it, while people see, you know, a voter register, you may see us at the county fair, right? Like judging your pig, eating your pie and registering people to vote, or we are at the dorm move in and move out days, that it actually requires much, much more to do the work that we do at the scale that we do it. We have the, uh, the best lawyers in the country uh, who represent us and do our work and they do not work for free. Uh, we have, uh, so we fight in court regularly in the court of public opinion, um, although I know better to go into a, get into a fight with Greg uh, and someone <laughs> who gets paid by the word. Um, so in courts, in court of public opinion, we build our own technology because oftentimes uh, the technology, the platforms that are available to movement organizations actually come from the campaign world or they come from like commercial practice uh, uses and we have to reconfigure them and it spends a lot of time, There's a, it requires a lot of time and money. So we have to build our own technology. Um, we leverage culture. Uh, so we, what we are also talking about is a shift in culture, uh, a shift in how people think about Georgia and, you know, what, and its political identity. Um, We've even, we've oversaw a shift in culture in how people vote. Uh, we've had to get on the doors and on the phones and talk to 75 year old African American people who remember a time where people weren't even allowed to vote where, as adults and get them to vote by mail when they have for the past 50 years, like put on their election day outfit to go say hi to their neighbors and go down and vote to convince them that no, Miss Mabel, you need to stay in the home uh, because COVID is real uh, and voting by mail is safe. Um, and so yeah, that is how we do the work that we do. It is very sort of robust uh, and there are a lot of pieces at play uh, to protect us and to protect the work. Um, Greg, I have a question for you, but I wanna extend the same courtesy that I did to Ensay, which is, do you wanna re respond to the um, conversation that we just had? Or the question I was gonna ask you is about, um, challenges to early voting, but I want to give you an opportunity if, if you want to jump into what we just talked about. Yeah, I can just address both, um, kind of all, all encompassing. Um, you know, the, the, what, what, as to what Ensei was saying, um, 2021 is going to be a giant struggle for, for over voting rights in Georgia after, well, two ways. First of all, if we think Georgia's become the ground zero for misinformation right now, um, you don't even want to know what's going on on the ground right here on, on social media. Um, with with prominent Georgians who are who are knowingly uh, committing falsehoods and perpetuating all sorts of, of, of false conspiracy theories, um, even though even though when you know they know it's not right and it's not true, but they're still perpetuating it. Um, imagine what happens in January fifth if the race is remotely close. What will happen over the next week or so? I mean that's that's what's keeping, I think, <laughs> politicos from both sides of the aisle up at night. Um, thinking what can happen. And then beyond that, whatever happens in the runoff, we've got a legislative session where um, leaders from both, it's a Republican controlled legislature in Georgia and leaders from both chambers have very distinct ideas of how to, uh, in, in, in some form or fashion, restrict voting rights. Um, in the Senate, they wanna um, ban at will absentee voting and um, restrict or ban um, ballot box drop boxes, which are being used in, in just about every Georgia county uh, or most Georgia counties right now. Um, to help people vote by mail. And in the, in the Georgia House, it's never going to pass because it needs a constitutional uh, two-thirds majority. But still, there's a push 
to end the election of the Secretary of State, which is the who oversees Georgia's elections, and instead appoint them appoint that position um, from the legislature. So you're going to see basically an all-out battle over voting rights in Georgia. So this is just the beginning of NSA's fight here and other people's fight over voting rights and ballot access in Georgia. Because in 2018, we saw that fight, you know, really escalate and intensify, but uh, I don't think we've seen anything yet. Um, and then what was your, your, your main question? Yeah, actually, you, well, I'm, I want to table my main question for a second. Okay. Um, you said you don't want to know about the disinformation. And I would say, actually, you do. I do. Well, I'm going to check my volume prescription and then I do want to know. Uh -huh. I mean, um, can you give me, yeah, like the greatest, a couple of the greatest hits? I mean, it's disturbing enough to think that this is just me, uh, but. We should have, of course, fights about policy, not fights about how hard it is to get people to the polls um, by moving ballot boxes, removing ballot boxes. But I do want to hear about the disinformation, and I know it's something that we have. Are, we're going to plan future hammer reforms um, and have. I want to refer people to. We did a great hammer reform, I think, two months ago, just on disinformation. So if you could give us a yeah. little bit of background. So three quick anecdotes, I'll tell you about those. First was two days after the election, it's Thursday, and I get a tip that Donald Trump Jr. is in Georgia talking about some sort of legal action. So I said, okay, I'll go cover it. I don't know what the legal action is. This was after the election, it was as it became clear, Trump, Biden hadn't overtaken Trump in Georgia yet, but everyone knew that was he was on track to do so. Um, I go to this thing, I see the, the chair of the Republican Party, I see a, a four-term congressman named Doug Collins who had just lost the Senate race, I see a a Democrat slash Republican state representative who is one of Trump's biggest allies in Georgia, and of course, Donald Trump Jr. And all of them are leading a stop the steal chant. And I think that was kind of my wake up call to what was coming. I, I, I don't know why, I just, I figured that, that, that you know, everyone, there would be sore feelings, but people would kind of move on. Um, but no, that didn't happen at all. And I, I kind of left um, that, that event kind of shaken because maybe I should have been more, uh, more cynical than I wasn't. Um, fast forward a few weeks later, Lynn Wood and Sidney Powell, two of the biggest pro-Trump lawyers um, who have been perpetuating these, these, these lawsuits that have been laughed out of court, um, that are full of conspiracy theories and, and false information. They held a rally in Alpharetta, Georgia, which is a kind of moderate suburb of, of I mean, it used to be pretty conservative, but now Democrats um, have won most of the city. Um, it's very split, but in general, it's, it's part of a, a deep blue county, Fulton County in, in Georgia. Anyway, you go to this event, um, they advertise it. I think there might be 50 people there, 100 people there, maybe some gawkers. I just go just to see and, and maybe interview some of them. I show up, there's more than 1,500 people there. Um, I'm probably underestimating the, the crowd size. It was the biggest Republican event I had been to in Georgia that didn't involve President Trump or Vice President Pence. I mean, it's bigger than any of the Senate can candidates events. And that's where they stood there for about an hour and told people not to vote, told people to boycott the runoff. These are Republicans, by the way, told people to boycott the runoffs um, and encourage people to, to believe in these conspiracy theories about the, the, the minion voting machines, stealing elections, algorithms that, that stole the vote from Trump, um, problems of mail-in ballots, all these issues. And I talked to about a dozen voters and you almost... I mean, some of them were diehard Republicans who wanted to vote and, and believed all this stuff and said, I just don't know how to cast my ballot. I don't know if I should trust the mail-in system. I don't know if I should trust the computer voting system. And as a reporter who, who you know, believes in facts, I'm telling them, you know, I'm sitting there saying, all this stuff you just heard was bunk. It was all bogus. Go, 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 you know, go look at any sort of uh, respected, credible media outlet and you'll see why it's bogus, but they don't they're in a different sort of alternate, it doesn't matter what I write. It doesn't matter what, what the LA Times writes. It doesn't matter what's on any sort of broadcast network, even in Fox News, they're, they're watching a, a, an entirely different platform. And the third event I wanted to talk briefly about was just happened on Monday. It was the day that the Electoral College uh, formally confirmed Joe Biden's win in Georgia and every other state that he won. Um, upstairs in the third floor of the Capitol, Stacey Abrams, Mayor Keisha Lance, uh, sorry, uh, Mayor Van Johnson of Savannah, Nakima Williams, a congresswoman elect who chairs the Democratic Party, were all electors. Um, and it was, a, you know, it was a moment. It was a significant moment in history in, in Georgia. Um, 
downstairs on the first and the second floor locked in a, in a conference room, um, the chair of the Republican Party of Georgia and several high ranking state officials um, had their own shadow symbolic electoral uh, ceremony where they also tried to uh, anoint 16 electors. Um, you know, of course it was a sham, but the very fact that we're here, you know, more than a month after the election and we've got, we've got this, this misinformation spreading. Um, and I know that in my stories, I, I downplayed it. I, you know, I said that at the same time, there's a rival meeting that didn't go anywhere that while well, the legitimate meeting was going upstairs. But I know that in so many other media outlets read by people who believe this, that they look like the 16 electors. And there's legitimately people who believe that, that Trump won Georgia, even though the vote has been tallied three times, certified twice, and state Republican elected officials have routinely said there's no evidence of widespread fraud or any irregularities. And the governor of Georgia has stood up to Trump and said he will not call a special session to overturn illegally the, the election results. So it's all, it's all a lot for, for a reporter who, who believes in facts. Um, I, I didn't, perhaps naively, I didn't create a disinformation section of our discussion tonight, but I think we should have it. And I wanna give our other two panelists um, a moment to respond. I think we were on the kind of pattern of uh, Mike and then Ense. Um, I mean, Mike, do you want to talk a little bit about how you reach voters when it comes to disinformation and how you can try and explain like, no, actually this is gravity and this is one plus one and it still equals two? I have a slightly controversial opinion on this because I believe that what is happening and what we're witnessing is a social problem that is manifesting in our body politic. It's not a political problem, and I don't think that there's a political solution to it. Uh, keep in mind, I believe very firmly, as do the members of the Lincoln Project, that the Republican Party exists as a real and existential threat to democracy at this moment in time. And I think it's probably going to be with us for some time to come. I think people can listen to this and listen to it with thunder and lightning because you're talking to somebody who spent 30 years in the Republican Party who is now telling you quantifiably that our democracy is not only unhealthy, it's extraordinarily fragile because we have one of the two major parties whose bedrock ideology at this point is focused on undermining the undercarriage of democracy. That is happening today in 2020. You're witnessing a president refusing to concede the election, declaring voter fraud, even when his own staff members uh, who are meant to oversee, who, who, whose job is to oversee the elections have said quantifiably that this was the cleanest, uh, most secure election probably in the history of the United States. The goal here is literally to undo democracy. It's a blatant move of power, which is, has all the hallmarks of authoritarianism. And we now, probably for the rest of our lifetimes, will be dealing with this threat every election cycle. And I say this again with no hyperbole, we're gonna be spending the better part of our careers fighting this because we understand not only that it's not just a fad, it's not Trump, it's what we have labeled Trumpism, which is again, a social problem where we are seeing people who are feeling their own loss of status, their own sense of decline, behaving the way that we have seen this throughout history, whether it was the conquered of the Aztecs or the Confederate soldiers after the Civil War or uh, Russians after the fall of the wall. They all display very similar characteristics, not just self-destructive behavior, like going out in the middle of a pandemic despite sixth grade science saying this is deadly and it can kill you or your loved ones, but also things like arming themselves and going and storming state capitals or, or having false events despite no evidence to the contrary suggesting that their viewpoints are valid. This is not going to go away when Donald Trump leaves on January 20. It will be a much harder fight to beat Trumpism than it was to beat Donald Trump. And we need to take this very, very seriously because this will be the fight of our generation if we are going to hold on to the American experiment. It will be a domestic threat, a domestic challenge. It will not be a foreign threat that undermines who we are and what our democratic principles and institutions are and have represented for 250 years. So with that, I, don't, I want to say, I don't believe we should be working to try to compromise with it. 
to understand it better, to bring them along with us. Anybody willing to go out in the middle of a deadly virus to wear a red hat and chant lock her up is not somebody who's looking to build a better society. They've already made the determination that, hope, that there, there is no hope for this country and they're willing to burn it down if only they can preserve power. It needs to be treated as such lest we uh, enter, um, I think, a very dangerous phase of American history over the course of the next 10, 15, probably 20 years. Yeah, I mean, that was um, about as terrifying as I had anticipated. <laughs> so um, yeah, th thank you. And when uh, Hammer folks, when we're, when we're back in person, um, I, you know, the, the bars to your left, um, and say, uh, we, we've now, we're in this topic of disinformation, misinformation. I know you think about this a lot and I want to get your perspective on um, what was just said and how you, in your work, try and combat that and, you know, convince people that they should register and they should be part of the process. Um, a, what Mike said was terrifying um and to very familiar uh, we i i live that um and i would also just take it a step further that so <clears throat> in my culture they say that when two elephants fight it's the grass that gets hurt and so when we think about the sort of intra party fighting uh, with the republican party um it we are the grass right our democracy and and voters and people who are looking for um ideological diversity and trying to figure out which party represents their interests uh we are getting hurt and i think we are getting hurt very specifically because when we look at georgia's secretary of state brad raffensperger um and the bullying uh, that he's been subject to by national party figures, right? Uh, by the president of his country uh, and, and other party leaders. And the way that Brad Raffensperger sort of decided to address that, to respond to that, is to launch another investigation into civil rights and voting rights organizations. That's not true. To one, stand up and like declare his conservative Republican bona fides. I'm a lifelong Republican. I voted for the president. Oh, and I'm about to uh, launch another criminal investigation into these voting rights organizations. See, I'm still one of you guys. Um, and so the idea that that uh, is uh, the posture that they've had to adapt um, you know, we've been telling people about this for a long time. Um, and so uh, I, I agree, it's not a political problem. It absolutely is a social problem, um, which is why we've been working with social scientists uh, to sort of address it. A, um, just trying to develop smarter, cooler, more engaging content, um, but also B, uh, making sure that we exercise some discipline, like, the way that we used to approach it was when we would come across one of the tweets that like Greg mentioned, or just misinformation, um, we would retweet and be like, look at this lying liar who lies. Uh, and what we now know is that the algorithm does not care about our analysis. And so instead of retweeting these falsehoods, I mean, there's a way to do it, I think an artful way to do it, um, but we work to put out our own content, um, that we work to cut through the noise um, that we work to amplify trusted messengers um, because uh, that is how, I mean, that's, the, that's one of the tactics that we've identified that has been successful, that has helped us combat uh, misinformation and disinformation. Um, and like elbowing for narrative space um, while we continue to organize. Uh, but I, I do appreciate uh, both Mike and Greg's sort of contributions because for a very long time, our work was framed as partisan, right? Like the fact that we were going out and registering these people or talking about voter suppression, it was framed as like partisan, that New Georgia Project was even framed as a sort of vanity vehicle for Stacey's political ambitions. Um, and the truth of the matter is that there have been these sustained attacks on our democracy and on our elections infrastructure. Um, because in an economy of ideas, this current Republican party, young people, new voters are not buying what they are selling. And so the way that they continue to hang on to power is by cheating, um, is by breaking the machinery of our democracy. And 
we need to acknowledge that you cannot fix what you have not faced. Uh, and so I think that we are seeing people start to face it, to acknowledge it, and I think we will we see our way forward. Um, oh God, we could do we could have just made this the whole um, uh, the whole form. Um, and but I want to get back a little bit to what we're going to see. It's December sixteenth, and obviously we're seeing disinformation, and I do think it's an existential threat. And I do think it's one of the things that we're going to have to uh, come to terms with. Um, and I think that Mike, uh, you know, laid this out in a way that will encourage insomnia among all 150 of us who are on right now. Um, Greg, what I was going to ask you about to get back to, you know, what's happening on the ground a little bit. Um, what I was going to ask you about is something you posted, I think it was this morning or last night, um, where you noted some of the challenges of early voting. And I know we already talked about this a little bit, but um, what's happening in Georgia? Is it, are we making it harder for people to engage in early voting, easier for people and why? Yeah, well, so far what we're seeing is, is somewhat surprising. We're seeing higher in-person early voting totals than I think most of uh, the operatives working on all four of the Senate campaigns is weird saying four, but all four of the Senate campaigns uh, were expected. Um, and it's hard to read into, into exactly who it helps more than it, it hurts because Republicans are actually a little bit enthusiastic that they seem like they're overperforming, um, at least to, in their numbers, what they thought they had. That might just be spin. But what we're seeing is um, something like 20,000 voters have cast ballots um, who didn't even vote in um, in, uh, in November, which is to me a huge, like a, a crazy figure already. We have about 700,000 plus people who have already cast ballots either by mail or in person. Uh, and we've set, we, we've exceeded our Monday and Tuesday totals. Uh, we only have the first two days in um, so far have already exceeded the totals for the first two days of the three week early voting period in, before the November election. So that's been a, um, a, a very big surprise. Um, the turnout overall in November was about 5 million. No one really thinks that we're going to exceed 5 million here in Georgia, uh, but certainly um, Georgians have got the message about how critical these elections are. And, um, and both, both the tickets, and I say tickets because David, Senators David Perdue and Kelly Leffler are running as a joint ticket, and so are Democrats John Ossoff and Raphael Warnock. And for the Democrats, they have to because they need to win both seats. Winning one seat won't do it. They need to win both seats to flip the Senate. Um, and and both these tickets are going after basically the same pool of 2.5 million or so voters that voted for either Trump or Biden in November because they feel like if they can just energize that base and spend, spend all their energy and resources and enthusiasm trying to re-energize that coalition of voters rather than trying to appeal to whoever might be undecided left. Um, I don't know if there's too many undecided voters left in Georgia. Um, but they feel like if they can go and recreate that, those coalitions and get the base out, um, that they have, a, they have a better chance of winning. Um, and I'll say this too, $440 million plus has been spent on TV ads. Um, you can't turn on your car, radio, your TV without seeing some sort of, usually most of the Republican ads are attack ads. Uh, probably 70% of the Democratic ads might be attack ads too, although they have more contrast and positive ads. Um, than the Republicans do right now. But what's happening on the ground is being forgotten some because of the TV ads overwhelm it all and the get out the vote efforts. There's these enormous machines. The Republicans have about 2000 or so um, volunteers and staffers who are working the Christian, co the, the, what used to be called the Christian coalition has thousands of volunteers working. Democrat, de Democratic and left-leaning groups have thousands of people working canvassing. They're, Democrats have returned to in-person canvassing, which they had abandoned during the, um, during the pandemic. They've brought it back with social distancing and, and other safety guidelines, but it's incredibly important for these races um, because I think at some point all the TV ads kind of neutralize each other, but it's those get out the vote, those, those personal efforts to contact voters by text, by phone, in person, visiting their doorsteps, that's what makes the difference and that's what's happening. And it's getting a lot less attention, but it's hugely important right now. Yeah. Um, Greg, can you say one more word on running mm -hmm. as a ticket? Because I think this might be something that people are glossing over and exactly what that means. Yeah. So um, in the run up to this election, 
um, you had a 20 candidate special election for Kelly Leffler's seat, Senator Kelly Leffler's seat. And so you had Raphael Warnock, who ended up as the top vote, get, vote getting Democrat, vote getter overall. He had four or five different other Democrats in the race. And so it, national, the National Democratic Party couldn't pick favorites, although everyone knew that they, they backed Warnock. They couldn't pick sides. Now that he is the nominee, um, the party can go all, all in for him. And John Ossoff, who is already the Democratic nominee, can basically ally himself with R Reverend Warnock. And so they hold not every event. They still have separate campaigns, but they held a joint event on, on, on Monday at, down at the old Brave Stadium uh, in downtown Atlanta. They, they were with Joe Biden yesterday uh, in Northeast Atlanta. Um, and the Republicans have done the same thing. They figured out that, that, that it's worth it. It's, it makes more sense to pool resources and have joint campaign events. They still have separate events as well, but they're big events. Like when Mike Pence is coming to, to two smaller towns in Georgia tomorrow, um, they'll be together with him. Um, and again, like Democrats need to, Republicans don't necessarily need to. If they just win one of the seats, um, they're, they, they, they regain control of the Senate. They keep the control of the Senate. But... Um, they figure that branding Republic Democrats together as uh, as radical liberals or whatever their their, their favorite phrase is uh, is more effective if, if they do it jointly. Um, Mike, this brings me to a question that I wanted to talk to you about, which is you know this is campaign strategy again, and um, I thought I was going to get to this question around five thirty, but as with all good hammer forums, of course, we've had a lengthier. We we went where the conversation took us, and I think that. Um, well, I already, you know, learned a lot and we'll, again, go back to my meditation practice, uh, plug for the hammer, uh, Thursdays at noon, I think it is. Um, so, Mike, we've talked about this a little bit and we've talked about what the campaigns are doing. Um, what are kind of two pieces of information or two pieces, excuse me, of uh, two suggestions that you would give the campaigns? What advice would you give them? Um, in terms of how they can bring it home. And then I was going to, I was planning on asking you this later, but uh, what do you think is going to happen? <laughs> okay, let me, let me help put this in perspective. Most, but not all of our audience is, is either in Southern California or familiar with Southern California. So what Greg just said is very important. $440 million, probably 80% of these campaign appearances, give or take, Greg, if I'm wrong, call me out on that are being held jointly. Okay, this, to put this in perspective, there are 30% more voters in LA County than in the entire state of Georgia. Okay, so LA County, for all of you in LA, by, by a good margin, there are more voters in LA County than in Georgia. That doesn't mean Georgia is a small state, but just to give you a sense of that kind of activity and how much money is being spent and focus and energy with thousands of volunteers on both sides. And I say this for one reason, both sides, when 80% of your campaign events are being held jointly, are recognizing that turnout of each respective base is going to be probably the single largest factor. Now, this is important because uh, when you get to a state like Georgia, which won by just what 20,000 some odd votes, right? the turnout pieces are clearly going to be there. The resources are there, the machinery is there, the infrastructure is there. It really never went away after the Tuesday, uh, you know, first Tuesday in November election. To me, the determinative piece is going to be, and, and it was said earlier correctly, and you say said it, said it correctly, the suburbs in Atlanta, Georgia are amongst or probably the most diverse suburbs in all of America. It's, not, it's a falsehood to think that these are just white, uh, you know, college-educated suburbs moving outside from the urban core. The, the suburbs in, in Atlanta are extremely diverse. But in white Republicans, which make up about 34, 35% of these voters, a shift of 8 to 9%, which we saw move from Trump to Biden, more than makes up the bulk of that's 20,000. I'm not saying it was determinative because everything else has to happen also. But to have people move out of their partisan foxhole is, is very, very rare in this environment. The problem is those Republicans did not vote for Trump. They voted for Biden. But down ticket, it would appear that they stayed true to their Republican roots. And so the question is going to be, 
How is that swing vote going to vote? So I have one bit of advice for both campaigns, both sides of the aisle. That vote is going to determine the size of the margin in the Atlanta suburbs with white suburban voters is going to be what determines the outcome of the race. The turnout machinery and the partisanship with everything else is already there. It's already in place. There's too much money and thousands of volunteers and all of the attention is going to be there to replicate the voter model that you saw in November. That will be there. I'm convinced of that. The only swing variable, the biggest movement was that donut around Atlanta that moved towards it wasn't just Atlanta, it was in other parts, but the, the, the number, the, the biggest bulk numbers are in Atlanta, moved from Trump to Biden, but kept that Republican votes down ticket. Can those enough of those voters stay with the Democratic column to put Osaf and Warnock into uh, the win column? So uh, I'm, I'm gonna leave the answer at that. I'm going, I, I, look, I, I'm not in the prediction business. I'm not trying to avoid the question. But I will say this, I think the Democrats are in a much stronger position than I gave them just 30 days ago. Um, oh, I would just actively try and avoid the question if I were you, but so, <laughs> so you, uh, you adroitly uh, discussed it. Um, and say, uh, well, I wanna ask you first, I mean, we just went through, you know, advice for the campaign strategy. I do have a question for you about uh, voter demographics, but do you want to first um, respond to what um, Greg and Mike just said? I'm just going to say that there are 4 million voters in LA County and 7 million voters in Georgia. The mm -hmm. state's growing pretty rapidly. Um, it was 7 million registered voters, 5 million people showed up to vote in the presidential election. Um, I will say that um, I mean, if I have uh, advice, listen, I think that Leffler, uh, Leffler and, and um, Purdue, if they wanted to be taken seriously, uh, they would actually reject the politics of, of their president and the politics of disinformation um, and acknowledge that Joe Biden is the president-elect of the United States. Um, uh, but obviously they think that they can buy themselves uh, uh, away into the Senate seat. I mean, I think that there's going to be a lot that needs to be learned um, from this election. We are headed towards the, the most, and somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but what is clearly the most expensive uh, congressional races in the history of American politics. Um, and for what? Uh, it, it's just, it's not clear to me, um, you know, what is for someone is making out a lot of money. Someone's making a lot of money because of this. Um, and I think that it's going to be really important that we inter interrogate that. I don't think that they will listen to me uh, at all, which is why we talk directly to young people and talk directly to people of color um, and talk directly to women and femmes. And if I would say that if they were interested in winning, that they would they should follow our lead and do the same. Um, so that, that would be my advice. Um, now, in, the question I want to ask you is um, about voter registration, but more really about voter demographics. Mm -hmm. How has, and you touched on this a little bit in terms of, you know, why you started your work and what the demographics look like when you started, but do you have some kind of statistics to explain to generally at an out-of-state audience? Um, what does the, how have the demographics of the re of registered voters in Georgia changed, let's say since 2016? Because I heard some really astounding numbers and it puts a lot of things in perspective and perhaps explains um, part of Joe Biden's victory in the state as well. Yeah, I mean, you know, 48% of the folks that have been registered in the past year are, are African-American. Again, one out of every three um, uh, voters in Georgia is Black. Um, we, Latinx uh, voter participation in AAPI, Asian American Pacific Islander. Um, voter participation has more than tripled. Uh, again, I think, um, I mean, there's a lot that is happening uh, in the state. There's a lot of movement, a lot of activity um, around the voter rolls. And again, 71% of white voters in Georgia voted for Trump uh, and he still lost. 
Uh, and so I think there's no more statistic, no more powerful statistic to me, um, because what I realize is that it is the multiracial, multi-ethnic, multi-generational coalition. It's white moderates and white progressives uh, and people of color um, uh, that are the folks that you need to be talking to um, in order to win in a place like Georgia that um, that it's not just Atlanta and not Atlanta uh, anymore, uh, in terms of like people sort of mapping out their path to victory, um, in Georgia. I think that, again, you know, we have five years before white people are the minority in Georgia. And I think as I think about like voter registration, civic engagement, um, the policy environment, what's possible, what can get done. I think about California and I think about Texas. Right. to majority people of color states, uh, but very, very different uh, sort of political cultures and political realities. And Georgia is literally defining uh, in this moment, like the direction that it's going to move into. Um, and, um, and people keep moving to Georgia. Um, and so while, you know, as a driver uh, and a person who doesn't like lines, I'm very annoyed by this, uh, but as an organizer and someone that does electoral work, uh, I know precisely that it's because of this massive uh, influx of folks um, that we are even in this conversation. It would have been Mike and some people from another state uh, because Georgia would not have been on people's minds. Um, I want to flag that. Um, and what was the last point that I wanted to make? Uh, I, I lost it, but Georgia's changing. It's changing very, very rapidly. Uh, it's changing our politics. Uh, it's creating new possibilities. Um, here's the other thing. I also feel like, uh, so incumbency protection, um, because quite frankly, like even before this moment that we were in, um, Georgia boasted the um, highest uh, number of members of its uh, state legislative black, black caucus. And so there have been black Democratic, for the most part, leaders in Georgia for quite some time. Um, I think that they are also being deeply impacted by this organizing that we're doing and the voter registration, et cetera. And so the idea that there are really no safe seats uh, and that all of this activity that's happening is coming to upend uh, sort of status quo uh, and incumbency protection. Um, and so that is I think that it's not just uh, Republicans that are going to be deeply impacted uh, by these demographic shifts that are happening. Sort of the old school, um, you know, I'm just gonna be like well-dressed black pastor who uh, is like the, the platonic ideal of like Southern politics is also being challenged uh, in this moment. Um, and so we, there, I think that there's more to see uh, on both sides of the aisle. Um, as we continue to register voters and Georgia continues to change. Uh, Greg, I want to go back to you. Um, and I'm going to ask you a question, but obviously, you know, we're please also respond um, to what we were just talking about. But I really want to talk about the fault line that's occurring in the Republican Party in Georgia right now that you've been addressing. And it seems to me that and I was asked about this like two weeks ago and I thought, what are you talking about? And now, of course, it's this huge issue, which is it seems like Republicans are in a weird place where they're saying there was massive voter fraud. You can't trust the presidential election results. And in fact, you know, we should send a different slate of electors, uh, which is nonsense. Um, but then they're telling people, but you know what you can trust? This runoff election, mm -hmm. absolutely you can trust everything about it and you should come out and vote. And it seems to me that you are seeing really a distinct split in Republicans uh, in Georgia and both in and out of state kind of saying, oh, you can trust us, you can't, you know, you can trust the system, you can't trust the system. Can you explain to us a little bit more about this rift in the Republican party and where exactly the fault line is? Yeah, I was down in Valdosta, which is a small South Georgia town where President Trump had his first post-election rally. And the headline from that story was, that we wrote was something like, President Trump tells voters to cast ballots in rigged elections. I and mean, that right there is the, is the mixed message that voters, loyal voters of President Trump are, are hearing in Georgia. 
Um, and when he introduced Senators Leffler and Purdue, I couldn't hear them speak because there was this deafening chant. It was so loud that even in the building, um, I couldn't hear it. It was echoing off this metal hangar that I was sitting in, in this part of this airport hangar in the middle of nowhere. Um, one of my colleagues watching it on, on, online texted me what, what they were chanting because it was so loud. They were chanting, fight for Trump, fight for Trump. They felt like these two senators who had both backed President Trump and both Kelly Leffler has like a hundred percent pro-Trump voting record, weren't doing enough to fight for President Trump because they weren't taking steps that I don't even know what, the, what they want them to do uh, in order to overturn Georgia's election results. Uh, and that right there was a snapshot of that fault line. And these, these are Republicans who are still siding with everything he says because they're so worried. Um, and I understand why politically, right? Um, they can't, I asked Kelly Leffler this morning, if she, um, if she now concedes Trump's defeat and acknowledges Joe Biden's victory. And she said, the process is still playing out. The process is still playing out because she's seen what happens to Republicans who have acknowledged Joe Biden's victory here in Georgia. Um, Jeff Duncan, the state's Lieutenant Governor, the second most, second, the number two Republican in the state. Um, he went on CNN the other day and said, Joe Biden won, we should move on. We should focus as Republicans on the January 5th runoffs. And within hours, um, Trump was tweeting about him being a traitor, being stupid, being too dumb, being a rhino, all these things um, that not only, you know, clogs up his Twitter feed, it's much more than that. He's getting suddenly, um, not him, but other Republican officials he's gone after have gotten death threats. They've had pro-Trump caravans parade outside their houses and intimidate them. Um, he will most certainly get a primary challenge now from a, a pro-Trump backer in 2022 when he's up for, for another term. And by extension, it's happening to Governor Kemp, who has not conceded the election. He has not gone nearly as far as some other Republicans. Simply, he certified the vote because he said he had no power to overturn the election results. And now he's being called by President Trump, um, who he's been, you know, one of his top supporters in the South. He's been called by Trump. President Trump a clown. President Trump said he was ashamed to have endorsed him back in 2018 against Stacey Abrams. And President Trump has invited one of his arch rivals, Doug Collins, that congressman I mentioned earlier, uh, to run against him in 2022. So these two sen senators can't do anything. As, and, I'm, and I know they're frustrated. Uh, I'm not making any excuses for them, but they can't, they feel like they can't do anything to alienate Trump right now because one word from him one tweet from him criticizing them could be it, could end their January 5th chances. Um, so that's the line they're walking. It's a lot finer line than Democrats have to walk, because Democrats have to walk their own line, trying to, trying to recreate the Biden coalition, maybe in the, in the, you know, from independent moderate voters in the suburbs and all that. But these Republicans, they have to fight the Trump misinformation while also cozying up to him at the same time. And it's, 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 it's impossible. I mean, it's an, it's an impossible ask. Um, gosh, I, I, I would love to say, and we're halfway there, but it is 615. <laughs> and, um, so I'm going to kind of ask my last, uh, question and then, which is a question that I see a lot in the Q and A, and then maybe get to, uh, one or two more questions. I've been trying to address them as we go, um, and, uh, womaning the Q and A. Um, a lot of people are asking some version. Um, let me go to you first, Mike, of basically, what can I do? I mean, I think we can assume that people are signing on on a Wednesday night to listen to this or a fairly engaged bunch. And this is, I'm going to wrap in something I'm curious about, which is, you know, I, I'm sure we all get all these pleas for text bank, phone bank, write letters, write postcards. Kind of what's the most effective way to reach voters and what can voters do um, this, oh, excuse me, what can kind of out of state volunteers do this time around? This is gonna sound very strange in my entire career. I never gave this advice until this, until the pandemic. And um, what we had always said was that, you know, social media has its own small echo chambers and Twitter is not the real world. When there's $440 million being spent in these races, and when I assure you, everybody's program is either fully funded or will be fully funded. Uh, I'm not going to recommend that you write any more checks to any other groups in uh, Georgia. You may get criticized for that, but don't send any more money in. I'm also not gonna ask you to send in postcards or involve, engage yourself with texts. The best thing you can do 
is amplify the voices on social media that need to be amplified to get them to drive the narrative at the national level, which again is advice that I've never given anybody until we started doing this successfully with the Lincoln Project. Because what we did, what we showed is that grassroots people can drive a national broader narrative. And when you start to focus the media attention through, again, earned media efforts, you start to have an impact because a, you know, a $100 check, a $20 check on top of $440 million is just, it's not gonna make a difference. It's, I'm sorry, it's just not anymore at this point. This, this is, they are at saturation level. You heard this from Greg. You're gonna to start to turning voters off at a certain point with all of the voter contact that is going on. What happens is voters are gonna start shutting down from all the paid media and they will, the very small number of undecideds that will be looking at, 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 at neutral media sources will be, will be swayed by the, the narrative that is coming out of, of what, what happens on cable and broadcast television. The best way to influence that is to amplify voices on social media. Never given that advice before 2020. Uh, and say, I can see you wanna answer this one too. I wanna thank Mike for giving me my, my chance to disagree strongly. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, so the truth is that there are, that, that, that spending money to advertise on MSNBC or on Hulu um, is not penetrating with young voters and black voters uh, and voters in rural Georgia. Um, and so I think that a lot of that money, so I, I partially agree, right? A lot of the money is being wasted um, uh, because people are firmly uh, in their ideolo ideological camps um, in this moment and much like you know, it is the nature of battleground state politics that um, the election would be decided by who shows up and whose vote get counted. Um, and so, um, you know, it's the battle of the basis in this moment and that the spending all of your money in the Atlanta media market is not gonna penetrate um, in the rural black belt. Um, and again, Gen Zers barely even watch TV. Um, and so like dumping an extraordinary amount of resources is not um, connecting with people who were born in 2002, uh, who are voting for the first time uh, in the election. Like we're spending time explaining to them how much a stamp costs and where to go get a stamp. Uh, because like that is the reality of what it takes to vote in this moment. Now, I absolutely do agree that please amplify the voices of uh, trusted messengers. I think that that's really important. I do think that shifting the narrative and driving the narrative is important for national media folks, people who didn't know about Georgia, didn't care about Georgia at all. Um, but also I think it's important for Georgians themselves, right? Uh, that it, it might not have shifted or moved anyone again on the ideological spectrum, but I think having president-elect Biden show up uh, was another sort of proof point to Georgia voters that like, oh, this kind of matters. Uh, this is a big deal um, and that we should get out and vote again. Um, so. That is what I will say. I will also say that I'm going to drop uh, a, a link for people who are interested in volunteering and who have uh, some time uh, or talent or treasure uh, to contribute to the work that we're doing, that we are fielding about 1,000 volunteer shifts a day uh, and about three to 4,000 volunteer shifts on the weekend. Um, so this is happening. Uh, calls, text, uh, knocking on doors. Uh, we're doing the same things that got us here uh, and we're gonna continue to do them until, until the new year. Uh, yeah, there actually have been a couple um, of questions for you and say where I think it would be uh, great if you could drop the information um, into the chat if it hasn't been already. Um, Greg, I saw you nodding along and I certainly don't wanna leave you out of this uh, question. Um, if you if you wanted to address it, but in I wanted I want to go to you for I think what's going to have to be our last question, which is um, from the people as well, um, which is um, this can be choose your own adventure. You can respond to what we just said, and then also uh, this next question, which is um, I'm sure you get this as a journalist a good deal, and I get it sometimes in class. And so I'm going to summarize four or five of the Q and A's that we just got, which is some version of well, yes, but I read it somewhere else, you know? And so a couple of people have asked kind of how do we combat either, you know, a T Tucker Carlson 
talking points that have no basis in reality? Or how do we combat uh, disinformation in general? Um, and I think we're gonna have to do kind of a separate discussion of potential solutions, but just really short term. I mean, how do you as a member of the media <coughs> respond when somebody says, nope, that didn't happen. Or, yeah. you know, or I read something else somewhere else. Yeah, something we struggle with because, you know, we've always been taught not to amplify disinformation, even if you're correcting it. Um, and I think, I think I've a lot of, a lot, me and a lot of my colleagues have kind of thrown that out the window because there's so much disinformation that we can't let, coming from the president himself, right? And, and other prominent supporters that we can't let go unchecked. Um, so I, I don't live my life on social media or anything like that. But when I do see something that's, that's flat out false, um, you know, the, one of the biggest things that was happening in Georgia was people were saying, why aren't they doing an, an absentee, a check of absentee ballot signatures? Uh, well, absentee ballots in Georgia aren't signed. The envelopes are signed, but there's no way to go trace those signatures back to the, back to the ballots themselves. Um, and that was one of those things that just kept on coming up. Um, what we've had to do at the AJC, because this is the Atlanta Journal, because this is an unprecedented challenge we're facing, is we've started an entire team of fact checkers that have gone back and have checked you know, we used to have, be a member of PolitiFact, and we still run PolitiFact, um, which is an independent fact-checking agency uh, run out of uh, out of a Pointer news, news, newsroom um, down in Tampa. Um, but we run their fact checks, but we also started to do our own um, because some things have just become um, so beyond the pale. And it's hard to combat these things. They get, you know, you turn around and there's another viral tweet that is alleging all sorts of awful things. Uh, one of them was alleging that two of our female state senators were actually actually counting ballots in Pennsylvania. And it was like, how, you know, they just picked like, frankly, two young white state senators who looked like two young white um, uh, ballot counters in Pennsylvania, I guess a little bit like them, but, but really, you know, and so we had to go on Twitter and say, no, this, this is not these two state senators. And unfortunately, these two state senators started getting death threats and, and vile, vile, uh, vile attacks. Um, so it's really a, a big challenge for us. Um, what we've tried to do is call out the lies when they're lies, either using saying falsehood, lies, um, uh, false narrative, how, unfounded, unsubstantiated, all these different words we'd never thought we'd have to say uh, when it came to election, um, uh, election allegations. Uh, we just need to be vigilant. And we also have to understand, frankly, and I, I think Mike touched on this, there's there's only so much we can do too. There is an entire false universe out there, a constellation of, of, of garbage being strewn. And it doesn't matter how much we try to engage. Um, there's a segment of the population that's going to ignore it. And we've got to focus on uh, the people out there who either, who amplifying the people out there who, who believe in facts. And, and maybe some of those people who, who do say, I just saw it somewhere, but I'm not sure if it's true, who aren't completely bitten by this conspiracy bug. Um, Mike and Ense, um, I want to go to you for um, <laughs> one of my unfair and now infamous compound questions, which is, you know, um, Mike, how do you, when people say, no, that's not true. And, you know, I mean, it's literally we're at the point of President, for instance, President Trump has lost 60 lawsuits. He won one totally insignificant lawsuit. We know what happened. We know what reality is. Um, and so actually that's, the, that's what I'll ask you. I won't compound this, but how do you say that's simply not the case? How do, you, how do we reach people? Again, I have a pretty controversial view of this, but I've actually begun to do this with my public uh, affairs clients, especially in the healthcare space as it relates to COVID-19 and not wearing masks. I believe that the answer is not to try to convince them or explain it. The goal needs to be to isolate it and ostracize that type of thinking, lest it get more and more people and grow. I believe it is a social problem. It's not a political problem. And to, to what Greg said, there is a whole Petri dish. There's a whole ecosystem of garbage out there that people are buying into. And I don't think most of it uh, has to do with people just being fooled. There's a lot of educated and informed people who are choosing to believe nonsense because the objective here, look, look folks, everything that Greg articulated about these rallies 
literally is authoritarianism. When people are choosing which elections they want to believe work and, and have, have trust and confidence in and don't in the same state with the same systems, and then trans, the chance at these same rallies of people supporting their dear leader, that is literally authoritarianism. It's here, okay? These are not people that want to be cajoled and convinced. The only way to, to deal with it is the same way we're dealing with the coronavirus. You have to isolate it and ostracize it and socially distance from it so that it does not spread. It cannot be convinced or cajoled or you're not gonna to go to a Trump rally and have people see facts they don't want to see. So again, I know that's controversial because our natural human tendency is to be like, how do we help these brainwashed people that are saying, saying the sky is red or the sky is purple and it's clearly blue? The answer is they're seeing what they want to see and the danger is they are undermining democracy as a means to an end. That's the danger. That's what we're dealing with. And say, do you want to um, address that? And then any kind of, as we go, as we enter the final stage now, any parting remarks when it comes to this particular election and what you want people to take away from it? And you're muted. <laughs> um, no, I just, I completely agree um, with Mike's analysis um, and like his sort of recommendation. Um, we've been looking for medicine, right, uh, to heal uh, what is broken um, in our country. And um, <clears throat> I mean, that was hard to hear, but I think it's the right response. Uh, and it is what makes sense to me. Um, I would just also flag that. Um, it's so funny. I used to joke with my parents, like as a child of immigrants, that like I used to get as many death threats as I got marriage proposals uh, in my like social media inboxes. And so I, as someone who has you know been subject to the violence, that it's like really scary, um, and and it's really real. And so despite the fact that like this might be fake news or it might be misinformation, that one we have to spend real money on real lawyers to defend us and our work, but also like have having people show up at my home, um, having people show up at our office, uh, that is very real. Um, and so, <clears throat> yeah, I, I am very worried. I'm very concerned. I think about the vulnerable, like the more vulnerable people are, the people who do this work. Um, and so just looking for, um, you know, supporters, protection, good vibes um, as we navigate our way through like the next 20 days of this madness um, because the intensity is ratcheting up um, and it, the desperation is ratcheting up um, and again, there doesn't seem to be uh, any uh, uh, we are definitely still in a dark place. Uh, we're definitely still in a sunken place um, as a country, as a nation, as a culture. Um, and so uh, I will just end by saying this, that I'm really, really, really grateful uh, to be here and to be here with you all and to be able to talk about the work that we do. Because uh, I know that there are over 300,000 Americans that are not. Uh, and there are major American cities that have less than 300,000 people. Um, and so, you know, while there's still air uh, or, you know, breath in my lungs, uh, and while I'm still standing on my own two feet, uh, that I'm super committed uh, to doing the work of building a more robust democracy uh, that sort of incorporates all the voices of all Georgians um, and not just people who can afford to participate. Um, and yeah, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I think that that will be, that's a perfect note to end on. I also um, asked all of you for probably a little less time than I actually took. So I really, really appreciate it. Um, uh, Mike, you've likely scared us so much that uh, we'll, we'll do the next <laughs> one again together in just a few weeks. Um, I also just want to say to um, the, everybody watching on the Hammer Forum, you know, Again, thank you for signing on for all of these. And um, I tried to integrate all of your questions and your good comments. And um, I'm wishing everybody very safe and happy holidays. And we have 
some great programming planned for the hammer, uh, both with and without me. And I would encourage you to sign on. So um, Greg, Mike, and say, thank you so much. And what's gonna happen is I'm gonna say hammer form, please uh, play us off. And then I'll text all of you after to say, no, that really was fantastic because it really was. And, um, and I appreciate your time so very much. So, um, and, and please feel free to uh, awkwardly sign off uh, when you hear the music, because there's no easy way to do this. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, guys. All right. Thank you. And um, Hammer Pros, I think we hear music. <laughs>